Uh, yeah, welcome. Um, I'm uh, Jan Simon Müller. I'm working on automotive grade Linux and I'm the release manager. I'm also uh, lead of the uh, CIAT expert group and uh, today I want to talk about um, some, uh, well, experiences I made while dealing with testing AGL. So um, it will be basically a, a quick overview what systems we looked at, what uh, we use already, what we might use or plan to use, and um, well, some observations. So take that with some grain of salt. Um, so I want to talk about a few systems um, that are here on this list and want to introduce you to um, Yocto P test. So who uses Yocto? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a good share. So um, Yocto P test, uh, I will introduce you to Fuego, Lava, Kernel CI, LabGrid, and R4D. So that's basically the ones I looked into more closely. And um, of course, there are more. So, but that's for another day. Hello. Okay, so p-tests. Who used the p-test already? Okay, that's like 10. Okay, so we, we have something to do. So what is p-test? Um, p-test is a part of, well, the Octo project, open embedded, to be more specifically. Um, and you can find the documentation here in the Yocto wiki. It's also in the manuals. We just need to stumble across it. So what is it basically? So TLDR, it is a way to package up the, well, actually most of the time, the test suite that a package a library ships already. Yeah? And we can then execute it on the target um, and collect some results. So let's say battery is dead. I'll use that one. So in principle, p-tests are a convention how things are packaged within uh, Yocto, uh, uh, OE. Mm, in principle, we create sub-packages. So if your package is called foo, we create a foo-p-test sub-package. The output format uh, is basically result, like pass, fail, skip, and then the test name. Um, basically, it aligns with the auto tools and the test suits that make test uh, had. It has some limitations because, well, you have a lot of pass, a couple of fails, maybe a few skips. How do you present that? So that's not handled here. P-test is also a convention how to call them. Um, there's um, Two things that uh, are applied here. A, we call that thing run dash p test. So we have a wrapper script with that name. And at the uh, final image that we deploy on the target, we have a small C application called p test runner, which goes through either a single test if I specify it or all installed p-tests, which can take quite some time. Let's take a little closer look. So you can write your own p-test and submit it to OE and Yocto. So a p-test. So I took this from the CLIP recipe. And I just, well, distilled the parts out that are relevant for p-test. So we have at the very top our wrapper, run p-test, as by the convention. We have 
the class inherit p-test, which enables all the magic to actually package it up and so on. We have one step where we can actually compile the test. In this case, it's calling make test. It might be different for your other applications or libraries, but in principle here we compile the test suite. In the next step, we install the test suite. Look at this, it's a special path where we actually install the files into. And yes, we might have to fix up some uh, path that are in the, well, probably test scripts or in the make file. That is likely unavoidable uh, in some cases because they still think they are with, we were compiled within the Yocto cross compilation and we don't run on the target. So usually a little fix up can be expected. Okay, well, so far that is not hard. Um, and in the end, we just tell which package or which dependency the p-test sub-package has which cannot be auto-detected. That is usually something like make or some, uh, if you use a Python or Perl, that might not get well detected um, easily. So otherwise, it's not hard because we just package something that already exists. So until now, we didn't have to develop any test. Um, we just package up what we already have. Um, Open Embedded Yocto has already, I think, in the number of 50 p-test packages, if I'm not wrong. Um, sorry? 64. 64. Um, so we have the, the most common packages covered, but there are probably a few more libraries that have a p-test which is not yet packaged. So patches, welcome. Here you know how it works. Now, how do we use that thing? So we did all the work. Um, we have to do two things. A, well, we need to enable the p-test machinery during building. That is the first line that is distro features append p-test, and that will make sure all the p-test packages are created. The second line makes sure all the p-test packages are installed in our final image. And then I can go ahead, call p-test runner. Um, alternative, if you just want like five p-tests that are of interest to you, well, you can always install only the sub-packages. This will install all p-test packages but you can also use, just use image underscore install plus equals and then name minus p-test. So, um, a few, well, personal uh, things that I found good or bad, um, take with a grain of salt. So, p-test is nice. It, it, compiles the tests as we compile the binary, so it's exactly the matching test, it's cross-compilation, it's ahead of time. Uh, it's well integrated with Bitbake, and there is also a feature called the test image class, which, will, uh, which allows you to basically automatically spin a QMO VM um, and basically run the tests on it. Um, so there is some uh, nice, simple automation available here. What I found a little hard is we have a lot of output that comes out of this. And it's not very easy to digest that. Uh, the run takes quite long, yes, sure. I mean, if we do a full pass of all test suits and GCC and whatnot, yeah, that's like, depending on the hardware we run that on, five hours or even more or less. What we get out of it is quite a large lock here and now. So there are helper scripts in the Yocto QA that allow us to diff between the previous run and the current run. 
um, which allow us to do some uh, analysis, kind of what changed, that is good. Um, but digging through that log is, is quite hard. Yeah? So the actual vi visualization of the results needs a lot of post-processing or additional tools. OK. So references. Um, so here is, that's the wiki. And this link is the um, BitBake manual. OK. Let's take a look at the next system, Fuego. So what is Fuego? It's a system, well, if I would condense it to one sentence, TLDR. So it's automated testing of an embedded target from a host system with Pre with a large set of prepackaged tests. So, what does that mean? We do not depend on the target system. We compile uh, the needed test, the needed resources on the host, uh, which is a nice feature actually because we test the production image at e as ease. We don't have additional resources installed, right? So, p test would be an additional package. We can remove it, yeah, but I mean, choose your weapon. So, what is Fuego? So, if you set up Fuego, you get a Jenkins instance that's preloaded with a lot of tests, ranging from LTP to all kinds of stuff. Um, simple stress tests, but you can also wire up. I don't know. Um, we have a command line tool that lets us instantiate those tests. In principle, what it will do, we have scripts to compile the tests for the target, so we have to define uh, what the target is, what compiler to use. It will then connect to the target, upload and run the tests on the target. It will grab the results. It has the capability to parse them and uh, visualize the results um, for uh, the tests where that is configured, makes sense, and so on. So here's an example. Um, so this is the configured um, set of tests for a BeagleBone black, a BeagleBone board. Um, we have different categories, benchmark, functional tests. So this, this list goes on very long, um, probably around about 100 or even more. The visualization is possible. We have, so Jenkins can store the results and we can actually draw uh, graphs and configure Jenkins to have those graphs for us. And then we see how things develop over time, which is quite nice. So a few notes, again, with a grain of salt. Um, large tests out of the box, that's a big plus. Um, the fact that we do not require anything beside basically SSH and a shell on the target is good. Um, the results parsers are very, very good strength. Um, now, for the use case that I have, or AGL has, um, if you are working on this on your desk with your board next to it, it's great. We have the assumption that we can actually connect to the board from the Jenkins. Yeah? Now, if we go with uh, an open source project, the board might not be where the Jenkins is, or the Jenkins is actually somewhere in the cloud. Then we would need a VPN. Um, we do not, well, what is not 
out in, in the box by default is deploying the port. You can make your own deployment Jenkins job and bring it in uh, the chain, but in principle we assume board is deployed and we have SSH over network. Um, each board, even if it's the same type of board, is its own executor in Jenkins, is its own configuration. Yeah? Um, now, it might be interesting to have kind of some sort of pooling. Yeah, I have like three beagle bones. Yeah, and we could basically execute some of those actually in parallel. Yeah, if we would apply the concept of executor and just crank up the number of CPUs to stay in the Jenkins, uh, uh, Jenkins language. Um, or the, yeah, the number of executors. So if we make that not a board, but a device type, device category, we could just crank up the Jenkins uh, executors on that node. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, a few references, if you grab the slides later. Um, we have the fuegotest.org a wiki, which is uh, kept up to date. There is a nice presentation about what Fuego is and a quick start guide how to set up Fuego using a set of containers. So it's quite easy to get jump started here. We also looked into Lava. Um, so what is Lava now. The Lava project just read it, or well, just got a new website, so this is just like two weeks old. Um, it was started within Linaro, and their need was to test on like, well, initially there are pictures like, like 10 panda boards. So we had a stack of 10 panda boards. All right. Um, so they started to scratch that itch and developed Lava. Um, in principle, it, its strength is device automation and we can execute then tests. So initially we are able to power up the device, pump the file system up, usually over network, netboot, and then we can, well, do something. Yeah? Execute a test and so on. So, what does Lava do? So it manages, the, it manages basically the devices in your board farm. So having 10 Panda boards, yeah, we have a device type Panda board and 10 instances. So it schedules, it has a scheduler. Uh, it manages the de deployment of the file systems, power off, booting, commands for the bootloader, test execution, um, again, multiple devices per type. And meanwhile, in the latest Lava, we have templates for more than 150 devices that come as part of Lava. So adding a device is quite easy meanwhile. The setup supports the actual, well, workers where the uh, devices under test are attached to be remote. So you can have one master instance which is basically accept accepting the job requests um, and multiple labs that actually have the devices attached, which could be in a different rack, different building. Um, um, yeah, they can be remote. So here's an example, um, that's from the uh, public Lava instance. Uh, here you see we have different worker hosts, we have different devices of a specific type. They are either uh, in good condition, bad condition, <coughs> retired. Um, so those ones are actually idle accepting jobs.
Here we see the output of one execution run. Before that, we have the whole downloading the resources, uh, getting the bootloader over serial to load the right files and so on. And finally, we have the user space up. And here we see actually how those, uh, how tests can be uh, ran. And we see those um, marks here. So we, we run a uname. That's the output. But we have here those marks for the test cases, which are then picked up by the Lava engine. Um, so we can identify that this portion here belongs to this test case, and the result is pass. So what's good about this here? Um, we have multiple instances for each type, which makes it really easy to allow multiple tests to run in parallel. Yeah, that would be similar in, in for, if we go for the Jenkins and crank up the number of executors. Uh, that is in here. Um, the master worker split allows you to have multiple labs. Um, let's say for, for a larger project, you might not have the boards, well, on your desk or in your uh, department. So it's possible to have boards where they actually are. And it's not hard to set up such a worker. Yeah. The simplest case that you can actually do is, well, don't expect miracles, but you can take a Raspberry Pi with, with a relay hat, and that is your worker. Yeah. What is hard? The initial setup. Yeah. It got, meanwhile, better uh, also uh, by using containers. So there's a project, Lava der Stocker, which is uh, hosted by the, uh, on GitHub by Kernel CI, um, and that makes the whole deployment easier. Um, the parsing here is not that sophisticated as, as in Fuego. So we have just basically markers here and the ability to collect results. We can collect some measurement, um, like a single number, but that's limited. So the actual result pro, uh, uh, um, parsing is uh, less advanced than um, in Fuego. A few references to the uh, documentation of Lava and to the Lava Docker, which will help you set it up in case you want to try it out. Um, so Lava Docker has um, one configuration file that's needed. It's called boards.yaml. And there's an example. If you copy that over, follow the instructions, you get a Lava set up with a QMU, with a Q, a QMU machine and that will get you jump-started quickly. Okay. Then, if we are talking about, you see there's a pattern, we are going more and more remote. If we are talking about multiple people working on a platform, on different boards, maybe the same boards, then we need a way to collect results. That applies to Lava, possibly to Fuego or different Fuego instances. Um, we want a way to collect the results, but because, well, to be honest, um, do we care that much about the actual testing? The testing is actually a tool. We actually care about the results. So we need a way to collect them. We looked into kernel CI for that. Um, now, kernel CI started out as a project to collect boot reports for the Linux kernel. And it, it was quite successful in um, what it tried to achieve. And meanwhile, the project um, 
is, uh, is, is organizing itself and we can expect some more development going on here. The initial tests were related to the Linux kernel and we, act, well, for the Linux kernel we are interested in does it boot, does it pass kind of some, well, LS is the network up, some very simple tests. Um, and that was the test case, basically kernel related. So kernel CI is good at aggregation and visualization of um, your tests. What is kernel CI? It's a database, it's a backend to parse the incoming results and a web front end. Um, the format for the results is uh, JSON and is, it is then capable of visualizing the results. Um, in this case, that's the official kernel CI instance. We see that for a given kernel version here, we had a couple of boards doing the, the run, the boot, and we see here the pass and fail rate. Uh, so for this use case, it's quite good, and we can actually um, collect the results of a lot of labs which are actually distributed around the globe. So it's a very um, distributed system. Most of those labs run Lava, some run custom tools, right? The, uh, uh, the upload is independent of the tool, so we could run whatever underneath. Fuego, Lava, doesn't matter. This is still centric to testing the kernel, so this is basically boot reports, what we care about. Now, for our use case, we have to take that to a another level because we are actually not, take, not, not interested in does it boot. We are actually interested in tests at runtime, yeah? different tests at runtime. So there has been the addition of, um, so this is the boot uh, tab on kernel CI. We have now uh, a tests tab and um, that's being further developed So what's good about this? We can actually aggregate results from multiple sources. Um, it's independent of the tool. We have a JSON format, um, how to submit the results. The setup, yeah, initially the setup, again, a little bit painful. Meanwhile, there's a kernel CI Docker, so that makes the setup fairly easy and repeatable. What is hard is that um, tailoring kernel CI now for different use cases like the user space tests, that is hard and um, kernel CI, they are, they are working on a redesign to make that easier. A few references. So there's the kernel CI Docker if you want to set it up. Um, there's a tool, kernel CI admin, which then helps with creating the tokens. Um, one example how it can be modified is Power CI. So that's a modification of kernel CI, and it's used to measure the power consumption of the system, uh, which brings in a quite nice a few graphs and so on, uh, but it's a lot of work to do that. Now you see the pattern. We are getting more and more into distributed and we are getting more and more into larger labs. So more than one board. So if you set up kind of your own lab and you um, yeah, add it to one of the engines, whatever engine you use, um, you sooner or later have the problem that you want to jump into one board and debug it. Yeah? Or you want to grab a board for local development, local debugging. 
So you need to take it, to take over control, yeah? um, block the board from further processing. And there's a project called LabGrid, which scratches that itch. Um, LabGrid was um, started by uh, Pengotronics and um, they maintain that project. So what's it? In principle, it's an abstraction of the hardware control. What does that mean? Well, power, serial. Um, and it lets you basically reserve a board, take over control, get the terminal from the board in a unified manner. It has such a coordinator and basically a developer or admin could then access, a reserve a board, a specific board, and access it. So you can expose the devices under test, either to the test tool or to the developer with this uh, uh, wrapper or where, yeah, with LabGrid. So what's good is we can then easily jump into the boards on the farm, debug them, without uh, yeah, big issues um, and without basically going through the, if we talk about Lava, without going through the worker node, right? You don't need access to the worker node. You get access through LabGrid. Um, it abstracts the hardware specifics, so how do we get the serial? How do we power on the board? Uh, that is basically encapsulated in LabGrid, which makes things like configuring it for, let's say, use in Fuego or use in Lava, easier because you have the same commands for all boards. You can hide the nitty gritty details uh, away. The setup, it's actually uh, uh, yeah, written in Python, um, installed with, uh, with pip. Um, I still had a little nitty problems here and there, so, um, but that should be better meanwhile. Um, the dogs are quite good. They are on read the dogs, um, so that will get you started with it. Similar, um, slightly different use case, but uh, quite interesting idea is uh, R4D. R4D um, was started by the um, RT patch um, guys, and they said, okay, we want to automate now a rack of, let's say, whatever device, and we want to hook it up to, let's say, a Jenkins. Um, so it is kind of similar to what a lab grid does, but it has and exists an, an interesting difference. So R4D, um, which is, uh, well, maintained um, under the uh, CIRT project. Um, so it provides infrastructure for power control and console access. And the interesting feature, it plugs into libvirt. What does that mean? So the idea was that we have a rack with some boards, could be an x86 system, could be an ARM system, could be some whatever board, um, doesn't matter, but it's sitting in a rack. We have a network switch, power switch, serial server, done. So kind of standardized components, yeah? a specific network switch, a specific power switch, a specific serial server. So it's not that flexible um, like the other tools but it allows us to hook into libvirt. There is a libvirt slave plugin which can talk to this R4D stack. 
And basically, to configure that thing, we would add a rack. We would add um, a power controller, so this specific power switch, a serial server, this specific serial server, and so on, and add a board. So we have power, we have serial. That's all we need to control that for basic stuff. So we will manage power serial here. We will allow remote control and we plug in into libword. That plugging into libword is actually the very interesting idea because that thing shows up in Jenkins like an executor, like a node. So it shows up as if it was a cloud machine. You can configure it like a cloud machine. Um, and Jenkins has the necessary calls to hook into libword and make that happen. So actually the boards will show up in Jenkins with those descriptions. Um, where's the board? So that will actually show up in Jenkins, uh, which is a really, really nice idea to do that. Um, so it's something for Fuego, right? Um, it's well suited. I'm hoping someone else does that. Uh, maybe I'll use our 4D. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so hooking it up with, with Libweird, great idea. I like it. Um, it's rather small. Um, the downside is currently only a specific set of power switches, serial server, and so on is supported. There is, um, uh, there is also like a tiny machine with some relays. Um, I don't remember that. It, it was in the talk. So there is possibility to extend that to do it also with other hardware. Downside delivered patches don't seem to be upstream, but we have Debian packages to our rescue. All right. Um, now, of course, there are more and other um, systems. This was basically a quick tour um, around the systems that I got in touch with. If you, well, I need to, oh yeah, that's how it works. Just a second. I need to move to here, and then I can show this over here. Yes. So if you are interested in what other systems exist, if you want way more ideas, then um, uh, I could uh, yeah, give you in, in the time available, then take a look at the test stack survey, which is on elinux.org. Uh, this is part of the uh, testing summit, which has been organized. Um, and there are a lot of, well, way more than I already knew. So that's a very interesting list of uh, test systems. They all have um, their specialty. Um, so check them out. They have some interesting ideas and solutions so you can pick um, your favorite weapon. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, we are wrap up and QA. So if you have questions, somewhere was the mic. Oh, over here. So, um, of course, the frameworks all have their own strength. Um, but what is important is, in my opinion, is that we can collaborate on those tests, that we can share, actually, the test results. Yeah? Because the more, well, it gets a big data problem in the end, but the more we can um, share here, the more, we c the more data points we have, the more results we can actually evaluate. Um, and then it becomes a problem of aggregating that, evaluating and visualization. 
So the big part is we need better um, tools to collaborate, to share the results, and to visualize the results so we can make something out of it and don't have like five megabytes of um, yeah, pass skip in a log file. And more boards, more boards that actually um, we are running the tests on. So that will help to raise the bar here. And that's my um, yeah, call to action here. Any questions? We have microphones over here. It's a little bright over here. Questions? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, the question is about, do you know any test frameworks that deal with the real hardware attached to the boards? So like bare board is fun, but if you need a microphone, a driver, something like that. But uh, do you know any ways that automate this like nicely? Thank you. Um, can, you can you specify, I mean, a microphone attached, yeah. What? Uh, no, I mean, the. Uh, if a board has some hardware that yeah. it works with a microphone, like a uh, digitizer or something, and you need to play a sound into that microphone yeah. externally, or you need to record a picture from the HDMI or something like that. Yeah. So if you need to drive external stimuli to the board, and yeah. you have to like control this some way, yeah. something like that. Okay, okay. So I'm sure you can wire that up with, with Fuego. Um, in a, in a job, it will not be easy. Yeah. Uh, similar, in, similar in Lava, you can, um, so in Lava you can attach a label to a board, which means has some extra hardware. So you can identify that uh, we have special hardware on that board, and you can basically steer a job to that very board. Uh, second, if you need some external input, uh, in Lava, you can, you can, in the job, it gets pretty long then, in the job description, you can start, you can either grab another board, which is connected, or you can, cre you, you, you can create a container which runs at the same time and which then does some poking. Yeah? I don't say the writing that test description is easy. Yeah? It's pretty spaghetti-ish, uh, but it's possible. Multi-node, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, could you run the microphone? Okay. Who has a question? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, um, a couple of things. Yes, we have done things with audio in Lava in the lab before. Um, there is some limited video testing, but as was noted, it really is down to the test writer, the, you know, and it's having the right support hardware there to be able to do it. Yeah. The second thing I'd note um, is uh, your mention of LabGrid and having access to the board. There is also within Lava <coughs> the concept of a hacking session. You can submit a job which will give you SSH access as long as you are granted that access to the particular yes. subnet in the lab. You can SSH onto the board once the image has been deployed. So there is that sort of access. And it will do all the power control, all the deployment for you. So just wanted to make that note. Yes, the hacking session is there. Um, uh, and I actually use that um, myself. Um, now, with LabGrid, you get kind of a set of boards abstracted. So. Yep. Okay, so to the first question, uh, we are also developing the Slav stack. Uh, the, it's also mentioned in the survey. Uh, and there is a custom made board, it's called MOOCSPY. Uh, it has add ons by its own, it provides Ethernet, USB, some kind of switches, etc. But recently we started developing some add ons to it, and uh, the microphone and the speakers are one of the add ons. So we use this, for example, to automate tests, tests of uh, like NLP and that kind of stuff. 
I'm also going to have a talk on add-on which allows you to grab a video and to provide some kind of input so that you can emulate some uh, user clicking or to get a re fully remote access like hardware, hardware version of the RDP. So generally, yes, we are doing stuff like that and if you are interested, find us. Okay, are the boards available? Where can I get a board? <laughs> yep. Okay, but I have to produce it myself. Um, hi. Uh, actually, okay, one last question. I think we are running running okay. late already. Um, for the audio testing, I think Google provides a loopback module, which you can use in order to also um, deploy sound and also record it in the same time yep. with a, with a um, delay introduced a loop. in the yeah a loop, mm -hmm. a loopback module. Uh, I was wondering if you have any solutions regarding the deployment of the image. Uh, you said about LabGrid that only uh, that it's an abstraction layer um, for hardware, but and the main problem we have, I mean, the main problem I had was deploying the, the whole image. And uh, yeah. the only solution was using relays and stuff like that in order to... You, that is the usual case. You need some sort of power control, um, either kind of a, a, a remote PDU with the sockets or a relay. Um, that is what you require in most solutions. So R4D, same deal. Uh, LabGrid, you need also, well, some command, be it okay, a relay. So it provides the, the layer, but I'll have to take care of the, of the deployment of the image. You, you need to wire up the board any, in, in any case, yes. Okay, thanks. That's true, that's true. So there will be wiring. You need to provide serial, some sort of power switch, whatever that is. Um, yeah. Just to add to that, so a lot of the modern dev boards are using SD cards. And so there are some solutions out there where people have made uh, SD card muxers. So you can switch the, an SD card image from being attached to the device under test to some host system. And then, like, which is... That's yeah, which is like, I'd like to buy that from Seed Studio. Also. That's that's quite nifty, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be some, uh, uh, some boards being manufactured soon. Everyone needs it, but it's hard to get by those, right? Yeah, Very you, can't find, you can't find them just off the shelf, yeah. that type of stuff. Would be good if we, if we come up with, with a board that does that for us. All right. Thanks for joining, and I'm around all week. If you have any more questions or want to deep dive into any of those, find me. And thanks for joining. <laughs>